that you want to deal with, like from other exams. And as I told y'all, the way you study for the exam, I recommend that you just go through all four exams with no help at all, just sort of see how you're doing on those questions. And then if you have something that's like, gosh, I just know this cold, then don't really worry about those anymore. Just take those ones that you miss, or maybe the ones that you got right, but you weren't really sure why you got them right, and then really focus on those questions. So hopefully that'll eliminate some. Don't go back to old exams unless you find some problem that you just need extra practice on, and then you can go back and look at those types of questions. So with the exam, I will take there are actually 49 questions, so it's a little bit longer than I said, 49. Um, I think it'll be fine. Like I'll be fine with it in two hours. But um, I take those questions, and then I'll change them up a little bit. In some cases, I just change the number. I change them all. Right, I, all of them are a little bit different. So if you look at a problem and you say, gosh, this answer must be what it was on the previous test, that's probably not the case. Right? In some cases, it does have the same answer, but it's a different question. It's just, you know, happening at the same answer. So don't freak out if it is the same answer. Okay. Um, so 49 questions, 1 o'clock for the forum section, 3.30 for the online section, but if you online students want to come to the one class. That's creepy, isn't it? Was that creepy? Alright, so uh, let's start with exam one. Exam one was on potential and fields and forces. And I'm not going to go over all the material because there's just so much. But I'll, I'll just sort of, we'll go through if you have questions on exam one. Drew? Right. Uh, well, hold on, let me, can I, uh, can I repeat? Can I qualify that answer? When you're doing force and fields problems, mm -hmm. when you're calculating the force of the field, you don't put the sign. But the sign is important when you're determining the direction of the vectors. So like for example here, if I'm calculating the force, my force is equal to k q q over r squared. And in fact, if I look at the equation sheet, there are absolute value bars around these charges. So when I put the charges in, I don't put the signs in. But the signs are important to help you determine the direction of the force. So for example here, I'm looking for the force on this particle Q2. It's going to feel an attractive force towards Q3 because this is negative and an attractive force towards Q1 because it's negative. So in that way, the sign's important, but not for the calculation. At no point is the sign going to come into the calculation. Right. That's right, because that's you're adding the vectors now. So let's say that this is F two three, and this is F two one. Is the force on particle 2 due to particle 3, then I would say F23, because it's in the positive x direction, minus F21. And that's where that negative comes from. But this negative here is not this negative. This negative is because this is pointing in the negative x direction. There's quite a few, uh, yeah, there are quite a few vector problems. There are a couple that are quantitative, yes, you have to calculate the direction and the magnitude of the vector. It's either a force or a field, right? Those are the only vectors we have. Um, and then there are some that are qualitative, like where is the electric field zero? Or where is the force zero? What is the direction of the electric field? That sort of business. So you'll certainly need to deal with vectors. That's very important. That's a good question, Drew. Is it, did I answer it sufficiently? Okay. What else? Test one. Absolutely, yeah, and this it's important like I was just saying to Drew. So um, so here I want to know what is the electric where is the electric field equal to zero? So the electric field is dependent upon the charge 
and the distance. And remember, this is absolute value when I'm calculating it. But here I'm not calculating it. I'm just asking what is the direction of the electric field. And to find the direction of the electric field is given by the direction of the force on a positive particle. Right, so if I imagine that there's a positive particle here, the force due to this charge is going to be in this direction. And the force due to this charge is going to be in this direction. And notice how I drew them as well. All right, let me go back and say that. So if I put a positive charge here, it's going to repel from this plus 2q charge because it's two positive charges repel one another. It's going to attract towards this minus 4q charge because positive and negative will attract. But notice, too, that I, how I drew the size of the vectors. The answer here is A, by the way. That is the right answer. I drew this vector small because it's close to a small charge. I drew this vector small, too, because it's far away from a big charge. So if I have a big Q, but my distance is also big, then it'll, it'll lessen the force because I'm far away from that big charge. So A is the right answer, but let's just draw, for example, B. Uh, B due to the plus 2Q charge is going to be in this direction. Due to the minus 4Q charge is going to be in that direction. So there's no way that those central points can have zero force or zero electric field rather. Okay? Is that? Okay. And uh, similar thing down here. You, is that the one you want? Okay. So similar here is that I want to know the direction of the net electric field. And so I have three charges. I have a 5Q. At this point, the electric field uh, was down, right? Because I imagine a positive charge there is going to repel from that positive 5Q charge. Due to the minus 3Q charge, it's going to be in this direction, a little bit smaller than the 5Q charge. And then due to the plus 2Q charge right here, is going to be also in that direction. So the net electric field vector is in that direction. Those two vectors, or rather these three vectors, the way they add up is in this direction. Be careful that you get the appropriate perspective on are the relative sizes of the vectors. So this 5Q charge is the biggest, the 3Q charge gives the next biggest, and the 2Q charge gives the next biggest. Olivia? Sure thing. So is that good on that one? The direction. So number 20, um, what's important here is not a vector, but instead the sum of your potentials. And you can have positive potentials if I have a positive charge, and I can have negative potentials if I have a negative charge. And remember V is KQ over R. Look, no absolute value sign, no absolute value bars around that because you include the charge. Because if I have a negative charge, it has a negative potential. It has to do with work and energy. And those can have negative values that don't mean direction. Um, so for example, here, I am not the same distance away from those two charges. If I were the same distance away, the voltage would add up to zero due to those two charges. However, uh, at this point right here, I am an equal distance away from those two charges. So for that, V is equal to zero. By the way, for the blue, is it positive or negative voltage? I'm closer to the positive, further away from the negative. It's going to be positive because the positive charge will have a bigger potential because, uh, I know, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Um, this will be negative. It's not important. Don't worry about it. We'll just drop. Forget. Rewind about 10 seconds because I don't want to confuse you. It's not important. Okay. Um, here, these two are equidistant apart, so they cancel out. The voltage is zero. And here, these two are equidistant apart, so the voltage is zero. So you take each point and you go up and then down. I take each point and then I ask, do these opposite charges cancel out their potentials, right? And in order to cancel out, they have to be equidistant from the point. So you wouldn't take, like, if you were doing 
C, you would do like plus one C all the way to the top left and the positive. Mm -hmm. So at C, I would say these two charges, that voltage is not zero. It's some non-zero value because they're not the same distance from that point C. Likewise, these two charges, their potentials don't cancel out. Now, at this point, these two charges do cancel out of those two charges. But overall, the net potential is not zero at point C. The same is true at point D. Only point B has a potential equal to zero. Is that clear, Olivia? Madeline? The direction of the charge. I'm sorry, the direction of the force. On which one? Number 20? Well, potential is scalar, so it doesn't have any, any direction. But instead, if I was asking about the force, right? Uh, yeah, this one's kind of complicated. I mean, you wouldn't see it like this. There's, with six charges, you got six different vectors. It would be too complicated. But I mean, I could. There were some questions on this that were similar to that, I'm pretty sure. Um, Well, like number nine here, what is the direction of the net force on the second electron? Is that sort of what you're thinking about? So on that one, the direction of the net force on the second electron, well, the force on E2 due to this one is going to be repulsive. It'll be in that direction. And the force on E2 due to the proton, positive and negative, they're going to be attractive. So the net force will be to the right. It'll be something like that if you have a question like that. Okay? What else on this chapter? Okay. Yeah, the signs do count, but I, I was just looking for the magnitude of okay. it here. Yeah, it sort of depends which direction you're going. Are you going from this side to this side or this side to this side as to what your potential difference is? So if you see a question like this, just don't. there won't be any negative answers. Okay. And so you would just okay. take the positive answer. But on this one, you know, the voltage is equal to Q times E. But you're right that it says negative Q times E, which is more correct. Okay? Um, you there, Carmen? Is that you? Oh, okay. All right, what else? this test. Chapter 1, chapter 1. Oh, we'll go to chapter 2. We can come back to this if we need. Uh, chapter 2. Olivia? Five or six. Oh, it's six. Maybe just six. Let's look at six. Okay, because this one's sort of more difficult, I think. You don't have numbers. I think y'all perceive it as more difficult because uh, it's just sort of harder. You have to think more about how those voltages are distributed. So I have these three capacitors in series. I know they add up to C plus C plus C. They add up to 3C. And so what I get in my circuit is a 3C capacitor in series with a C uh, capacitance of value C. So one has three times the capacitance of the other. And then I know that I have 12 volts here. So now a couple things that I know. I know that this capacitor has the bigger voltage. Remember, this is different for resistors. Like, big resistors have big voltages. But for capacitors, small capacitors are the one that have big voltages. And that's because of this whole thing, Q equals CV. The charge is constant, so if C goes down, V goes up. There's an inverse relationship. Small capacitors have big voltages. So I know that this has the bigger of the two voltages, and this one has the smaller. Now I'm looking for the voltage across this capacitor, which is this one. So I know that it's going to be a bigger voltage. So you could probably look at this and say, well, it's probably not going to be three, because that's kind of small. I also know that this voltage plus this voltage, which I'll call two, three, four, that that has, that has to equal to nine. 
I mean 12. I also know that V1 is going to equal to 3 times V234 because it has one third the capacitance, it's going to have three times the voltage. Big capacitor, big voltage, right? So the only numbers that, that fill this requirement, I mean, you can solve the system here, but the numbers will be fairly straightforward for you. Think about what number plus three times itself is equal to 12. Or rather, I'm sorry, what number plus one third of itself is going to equal to 12? So that's going to be... 9 volts plus 3 volts is equal to 12. So the answer here is going to be 9. It's the bigger, it's actually it's the biggest voltage that's there. Those are tricky, um, but you'll certainly have some questions. We saw some with resistors as well. You will absolutely have circuits on the test that will be similar to this. And so uh, be able to do these kinds, but also look at other types of circuits because like I wouldn't give you this circuit if I gave you this question, which I did. I would give you a different circuit that would be similar in difficulty, but, you know, different. But back at old tests, you'll see some similar problems to those. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. Uh, what else? Who asked this? Was that you? Yeah. Is that clear? Okay. All right, what else? Okay, so uh, multi loop circuit. Here I want to know just the equations. And so with this, you'll just want to go one by one through them. A is 10 plus 4i1. So I know I'm starting right here, and I'm going in this direction because I have positive 10. So just look at the first element and then determine which direction am I going. I know I'm going in that direction instead of this direction because I'm going from little side to big side, from low to high potential. I get a positive change in potential on that battery. All right? If I was going the other direction, it would be negative. And we have those rules for how to write out the equations. So I have 10. This should be minus 4i1. Well, look, I have positive. So that can't be right. So that doesn't jive. Uh, i1 plus i3 equals i2. That would be right here. The junction rule, it should read i1 plus i2 equals i3. So that's not right either. And then this next one, let's see, I have 4I1. So that's looking at this resistor, and now I need to determine, is it in this direction or in this direction? Well, if it were in this direction going with the current, it would be negative, right. So that means I'm going in this direction, 4I1, uh, that should be minus 10, right, because I'm going from high to low potential. I'm losing energy across that battery. So it must be this one. Let's see, uh, 2 plus 3i2, 2 going in this direction, plus 3i2, because I'm going against the current, minus 4, minus 4, high to low, so that's negative. So that one is right. Uh, some other things you could do, like I could change the current, like, like what if this said i1 instead of i2, that would make it incorrect. I could also uh, like start a loop here, and then uh, I would say start a loop here, or I would say start a loop here, and then go around, and then come back to here. That's not a closed loop. That would be, you know, a not closed loop because it doesn't stop and start at the same time. Can you number two? Uh huh. So number two, twenty-two. Right. I want to use those equations, although. I'm looking for I1, so I don't have an equation that gives me I1. I have to write a new equation to find I1. It's always best to choose a loop that only has one resistor. So, like you could look at this loop. It has I1 in it, but it also has I2. So if you see something like this, you want to choose the loop that only has one resistor. I would choose that outer loop, the big loop, and it would look like this. I would have... Uh, Starting right here and going in this direction, 10 minus 4i1 plus 4 equals 0. And then solve that for i1. So i1 equals uh, negative 14 over 4, which is equal to negative 7 halves amps. So I know it's either A or B. Is it to the left or to the right? Well, this arrow we chose is going to the left. 
When it comes out negative, so that means that the direction is opposite what we chose, so it's going to be to the right. Okay, is that clear, sir? All right, these are all great questions. You're going to, I mean, 48 questions, we only had like 80 questions, so you'll know you're going to see most of the questions on the test. So what did you say? Uh, seven halves. You said left and then the to the right. To the right. I said that uh, the arrow here points to the left, right? Let me double check my answer. So, oh, yes, I'm sorry. So it's negative 14 over negative 4, which comes out to be positive 7 halves. So it is 7 halves to the left, which is as it's shown. Sorry about that. If it was negative, it would be to the right, yeah. No. If it was negative, it would be to the right because it would be opposite of this arrow. That's right. It's the opposite of the chosen direction, the, the direction that you chose. I mean, you didn't choose it here. I chose it for you, but all right. All right, what else on this test? Exam two. Exam two. Going, going. I right, we can come back to it. Let's go to exam three. You want to go to the circuits and stuff? Exam three. Olivia? Number three. Um, I haven't even gotten to the bottom of it yet, so I'm not about it, but just from trying to remember, because I took it, it says discharging, so, but then it says the charge after the five seconds, which in my head made me think it was. Yeah, I saw that later. There is, that is a mistake. Okay. If I can, let me, uh, my computer's locked up. So that was pretty good. Okay, uh, number three. Can y'all see these okay, by the way? On the screen? Yeah. It should say charging, Olivia, not discharging. All right. Does that make more sense? Yes. Yeah, you, the equations are labeled on the equation sheet, but just know how to use those natural logs and stuff, or the uh, exponentials in the natural logs. Are we sorry? Mm hmm. this one yeah so here I wanted the electric force to exactly cancel the magnetic force and I know that my electric force is equal to QE and my magnetic force is equal to QVB so on this problem regardless of how it's been changed you're always going to start with this QE equals QVB right that my electric force cancels out my magnetic force often we'll do this in instruments uh, scientific instruments. We're using an electric field and use a magnetic field. And in this case, we're looking for the velocity. So it turns out that the charge doesn't matter, and the velocity is E over B. The electric field is 1,000. The magnetic field is 2 Tesla. And so that's going to be 500 is the answer. 500 meters per second. All I'm doing I don't get all wrapped up in the right-hand rule and all that stuff. That's not really important here. All that's important is that I want my electric force to equal my magnetic force. And then I'll solve for whatever it is I'm looking for. Okay, Brittany? Sure. Okay, so... Uh, which one are you supposed to rank them from highest to lowest index of refraction? You should also, by the way, be able to rank them in terms of speed. But if you can rank them in terms of velocity, uh, in terms of uh, index, then it's just it's fairly straightforward to go to speed. I'll, I'll address that in a second. So first of all, use my wave model of light, this ray front. At this point, it speeds up. I know that it speeds up because it's a bending away from the normal. I go back and think about our bulldozer analogy or our marching band or whatever. It speeds up so this side goes a little faster and twists in this direction. So it's speeding up here. It speeds up moving from medium 1 to medium 2. That means that N2 is less than N1 because if V is big, 
that means n is small. Okay, so n2 has a small, in, or a medium 2 has a small index of refraction. It has a big velocity, small index of refraction. All right, so here, going from 2 to 3, it's going to slow down right here and twist around. So here it slows. So that means that n3 is bigger than n2. All right, so uh, so far I have, what do I have? Um, Oh, let's do this second as well. So now let's also imagine going from here to here. So I'm going to have medium 1, medium 3 right here. It's going to bend towards the normal. Basically, I just bumped out that medium 2, got rid of it completely. Here, it's going to slow down. So N3 is going to be bigger than N1. Okay? So we want to rank them from highest to lowest index of refraction. Looking at these inequalities, I can tell that N3 has the biggest index of refraction. So it's going to be 3. If I can get rid of A, B, and E, it's either going to be uh, 3, 1, 2, or 3, 2, 1. Now, N1 is bigger than N2, so that means it's going to be 3, 1, 2. All right? So 3, 1, 2 is the answer. And by the way, if I was ranking speeds, It'd be the opposite. It would be 2, 1, 3. Because there's an inverse relationship between in index of refraction and the speed of the light. Okay? I could ask you just, I could ask you which one has the biggest index of refraction? Which one has the biggest speed? I could ask you to rank them. I mean, of course, I would change how the rays are going. So don't just memorize it, but be able to work through it. Okay? Is that clear? All right. Sure. I know this is fast, y'all, but we have a lot of stuff, so uh, if I go too fast, you just stop me. Okay, so on this one, a couple things that you need to recognize, because I don't usually tell you the type of mirror, but a security mirror is a convex mirror, and further, it has a negative focal point. So, first of all, the big thing is the focal length is negative 20. Uh, if you stand 40 centimeters, that's P, from the mirror, what is its magnification? So the first thing you need to do is find Q. I know that 1 over F, that's 1 over 20, is equal to 1 over 40 plus 1 over Q. So that is uh, negative 3 over 40 equals 1 over Q. So Q is equal to negative 40 over 3. And then I know that my magnification is negative Q divided by P is going to be uh, negative, negative 40 over 3 divided by 40, which is positive 1 third. Look, as is often the case, just a second, I'll ask the question, but as is often the case, you should look at the options that you have here. Because for a security mirror, this is the only option that is possibly correct. Because a security mirror, a convex mirror, never inverts the image. It's always upright, and it's never the same size as the object. All right, it's always going to be smaller and upright. So, you know, look through the options, and you'll might you'll at least be able to get rid of a couple of them, but you might be able to get rid of all of the possible answers. I'm jumping ahead, but for um, convex lens, for mm -hmm. focal point is constant. Mm -hmm. Right. So remember, with convex lenses and mirrors, just a second, I'll idea we'll get you. So mirrors. Convex, the mirrors look like this, like a security mirror. Concave, they look like this, like that mirror that we saw in class that you look upside down in or a shaving mirror. For lenses, convex looks like this. Concave look like this. In fact, there's really more of a, a similarity between convex mirrors and concave lenses and concave mirrors and convex lenses. They're really more similar in that these have a negative focal length, as you said. These also have a negative focal length. They're both diverging devices. That's, that's where they're similar and what they do to the light. Okay?
It's a good distinction. It's important to remember. Olivia Jones. Yes. Okay, you have some right hand rule, but you don't have a whole lot of right hand rule. So, um, oh, I'm sorry. 14 and 16. 14 and 16. 13, oh, 13. Okay, we're going to do 13, 14, and 16. All right, so 13 was difficult because you had to do a couple of applications. So, first of all, you want to figure out what kind of magnetic field is this particle moving in. And so, this wire produces a magnetic field. Now, I'm in the direction of the current goes into the page, out of the page. So on the side that we're concerned with, the magnetic field is out of the page. It's into the page over here, but that doesn't matter. And now I have my V going to the right. My finger's in that direction. B is out of the page. Or if you want to think of it as folding towards B, that's fine. And then my force is going to be down. Recognize that this is a positive particle, so this particle will move downwards. Variations on this could be I give you the direction that it travels, and I ask you the direction of the current. There are similar questions that I don't know what's best. Okay? Good? About what? The whole thing? Yes. Why do you draw into the page out of the page? Okay, let me start over. So the current. First part, figure out the magnetic field. The current is up, right? I let my thumb go in the direction of the current. My fingers go into the page on this side, and they wrap around and they come out of the page on this side. That's how I drew this magnetic field coming out of the page. And then the next thing I want to do is figure out the force that acts on this particle as it moves through this magnetic field. And so this is the second part. V is in this direction. The magnetic field is out of the page, and so the force is down. The force on this particle is down. Okay. It's important. You will see some right-hand rule, not an inordinate amount, but you know. Fewer than we saw on this test, but you will see some. Okay, 14 is similar, a little bit different. It's just sort of like the first part, but twice. Um, so on 14, you want to figure out what does the magnetic field do to this charge? Well, thumb goes into the page, and my fingers wrap around. My magnetic field is in this direction. What is that? Clockwise. Thumb goes into the page. My fingers wrap around, giving the magnetic field. Similarly, over here, my thumb comes out of the page. My fingers wrap around in the counterclockwise direction. Like this. Now at these points up here, at point P, I get a vector in that direction and I get a vector in that direction. So when you add up those two vectors, the answer is B. It's the only vector in between those two. We're good on 14? Okay, and 16 as well, right? Okay, so 16, a positive particle travels into the page. So V is into the page. The magnetic field runs from north to south. So my magnetic field is like that. And I want it to go undeflected. So what must the electric field be? Well, first of all, I want to figure out what is the direction of the magnetic force. V is into the page. Magnetic field is to the right. And so my force, Fb, is down. That's my magnetic force down. But I want to know then what electric field will cause an electric force to go up. Now, if this was a negative particle, it would be opposite the electric field. But because it's a positive particle, the electric field has to be in the same direction as the force. All right? Remember, electric fields exert a force that's the same direction that a positive particle would feel. Positive particles feel a force that's in the same direction as the electric field. Okay? Yes. Hmm? So then why 
How did we figure that out? Why did what? How did we suppose that I'm ready? Like oh, because you first have to figure out what is the direction of the magnetic force. Because we only know the electric force is up because it's opposite the electric, the magnetic force. The electric field is the same as the electric force, the direction. Let me step back through it. I see a little confusion on your faces. So just let me step back through. So first of all, I need to figure out, I, I realize I have two things. I have a magnetic force and an electric force, an electric force. And they have to be equal and opposite one another in order for it to go through undeflected. Because as one force pulling one direction, another force pulling another direction. So it just travels straight. Um, so first I figure out what is the magnetic force. And then I know my electric force is just going to be opposite the magnetic force. So that's where I drew the velocity vector into the page, the magnetic field vector, which runs north to south, so to the right. And then I figure out this magnetic force. The the magnetic force is down. So if the magnetic force is down on this positive particle, the electric force must be up. Here's my positive particle. I have a magnetic force. I have my electric force then has to be opposite that in the upward direction. And in order to get that electric field with a force that's upward, the electric field is in the same direction as the electric force because it's a positive particle. If it was negative, everything would sort of shift a little bit, actually. So if it was a negative particle, first, your magnetic force would be opposite what the right-hand rule tells you. And so the magnetic force would be upwards. And then the electric force would have to be down. But the electric field is now a negative particle, so the electric field is still going to be up, even if it's a negative. So you have to sort everything switches around, but the answer works out for you to say. Okay? There's a lot of stuff going on in that problem. Lots of things you have pieces you have to fit together. Okay. Uh, who asked that? Is that okay? Good question. How many right hand questions that we don't have? Uh, I mean how many do we have on this test? We had one, two, three, four. We said four. I think there's just a couple. Not that many. But you know, you don't want to miss as few as possible. So, All right. Uh, what else on exam three here? Olivia? Well, you know what I always think of? Because I always forget, too. It's like, gosh, is it bigger or smaller or what? I think of, uh, of a fiber optic, right? Fiber optic is plastic or glass. The fiber optic, I know that glass has a bigger index of refraction than air. So the, the core has to have the bigger index of refraction because that's what it is, right? It's glass and then air. And so N1 then has to be bigger than whatever's outside of it. Now it doesn't matter that this isn't air, right? It's just some special protector over it, but it still has to have a smaller index of refraction. And the reason is, is that when light is traveling from N1 to N2, you want it to bend away from the normal. And the only way for it to bend away from the normal is if N2 is less than N1. Right, remember our wave front model? That I want this side to speed up so that it bends in that direction. If it's opposite, if N2 is bigger than N1, it's going to bend towards the normal, and you're never going to get total internal reflection. But if you're just dealing with something like this, I just remember that fiber optics are glass surrounded by air at the very basic level. And so the core has to have a bigger index than the, the surroundings. But it doesn't matter that it's a cladding. Like that, that's irrelevant. It could be air. OK? Right, what else? This test. Exam three. These are all great questions. Carmen? Three? Okay, yeah. So remember, I addressed this earlier. This should be charging, not discharging. And because it's charging, Q is equal to 
Q times 1 minus E to the minus T over RC. And so first of all, you sort of need to make sure you're using the right equation because there's another one for a discharging capacitor. But this is a charging capacitor. Um, Oh, wait, no, no, I'm sorry. This is a discharging capacitor. Sorry. I uh, misled. I lied to the person before. Sorry. Who, would I, who asked that question? It is right. It says discharging. That's what it should say. It's initially, it's fully charged by a battery with our voltage of 10 volts. That means that I start out with a charge equal to C times V, which is 10 times 10, or 100 microcoulombs. That's 10 times 10, C times V, E is just another word for, for my voltage. And I want to know what charge is it after 5 seconds. So to discharge, Q is equal to Q times E to the minus T over RC. That's for a discharging capacitor. It's labeled on your equation sheet. Just make sure you know how to, how to use it. And so that's 100 times E to the minus... 5 over RC, that's 2 times 10, that's 20. I think that's 77, is that right? Was it 80 the answer? Yeah, so, uh, so 80 is the answer there. Um, remember that if I plot this Q versus T for a discharging capacitor, it looks like that. That it starts out big, but then it follows this exponential decay. <laughs> Okay. Are you doing? Let me see how you're doing. Oh, yeah, you have to do PD. Do you know how to do that? It's usually the second. And then you have to multiply that times 100. Okay. All right, what else from this test? Exam four. Okay, Tyler, you have a question? Uh, on your calculator, the exponential button on your PI is usually second. Yeah, it's second. Yeah, it's second. Yeah, just make sure you know how to use the exponential. That's really my main thing. And be able to identify the graphs. I think that's all you saw on that test with RC circuits. I go away from here, y'all? All right. Uh, anything else on this test? All right, let's look at exam four. This is sort of the freshest. Any questions on this one, Olivia? I worked it out, but I kept going back to it every time I got to it. Alright, so look, we want to start with our lens equation. 1 over F equals 1 over Q plus 1 over B. And so with your eye, Q is constant. With your camera, F is constant, but with your I, this is constant. And so if I look at something far away and then I bring it closer, what's happening is, is that P is decreasing. And if Q is constant, that means F is going to decrease. So my lens is decreasing its focal length. You follow me so far? That's the first step. What is the, what is the focal length of the lens doing? In this case, the focal length of the lens is getting smaller. Okay? Because Q is constant with your eye. The image is always formed a certain distance behind the lens, which is on the retina. So Q is constant. If P decreases, then F also decreases. So if F decreases, that means that my lens is going from looking like that 
it's looking like that. Because remember our lenses, they're cut out of a bigger sphere. And so like this sphere right here has a radius that's over here. But this sphere right here has a radius that's much smaller. So it has a smaller focal length. Okay? To get a smaller focal length, I have to squeeze down that lens. Those little muscles in your eye, they squeeze your lens, sort of squish it together so that it gets a smaller focal length. That's a tough question. A lot of people miss that. Yeah. All right. Uh, what else? Uh, with a camera, it's a similar question. With the camera, this is a constant, but f is constant. But it would work similarly. Okay. What else? Okay, sure. Okay, number five. So with optical devices, we have some that are converging. So just looking at convex lenses, this is a convex lens. It causes light to converge. However, concave lenses cause light to diverge. All right. So this is a concave lens. Uh, concave lenses and convex mirrors are similar. This is a convex mirror. The light rays come in and they diverge from one another. That's why they, they act identically, actually, in the types of images that they form. So concave lenses and convex mirrors are both diverging. They both cause the light to diverge. All right. This is a need to know that. Uh, I think Olivia was next. Olivia? Yeah, so what you need to know here, uh, I guess I had the same picture on a previous exam. Is that what you mean? Yes. Okay, yeah, well, don't expect that. Um, in fact, it could be an open closed pipe or an open open pipe, and it would look a little different. So let's go through all three. So here, um, I need to recognize that I have one wavelength and then another half wavelength. So I have one and a half wavelengths. I have three halves of a wavelength is equal to the length, the total length, which is six meters. And then I solve for lambda. So lambda is six times two thirds, which is four meters. So that means that this one wavelength right here is a distance of four meters. Follow? All right, but you know, I mean, I could do a different shape. Like I could have, instead of having three, I could have four peaks. And this would be, like if this was one length, if this was six meters, then I would not say one and a half wavelengths, I would say two wavelengths is equal to six meters. So lambda is equal to three meters. So you have two distinct wavelengths, one here and one here. I start here, that's one, that's two. Similarly, if I have an open closed pipe, but no down here. All right, how many wavelengths is that? Well, I know it's going to be an increment of quarter wavelengths, not half wavelengths. So I want to pick this out. I have uh, one wavelength right here. I have another half right there. And then I add on an extra quarter. So I have one and three quarter wavelengths equals to, well, we'll say this length is six meters again. And then I solve for wavelength. Or it could be an open, open pipe. The open, open pipe works very much the same as the close, close pipe or the string, but the open, open pipe would look like this. This one's a little trickier, but I mean, how many wavelengths do I have here? I have one wavelength here. 
and then I have another half wavelength here. So I have one and a half wavelengths. A wavelength is always going back to the same point, the same type of inflection. So here it's moving up, and so I come over here to where it's moving up. That marks one full wavelength. And then I go up, and that marks a half wavelength. Okay? Does that help a little bit? Yeah, I'll look back maybe at your notes if you missed that problem or if you're not certain about it. Yeah. I just want to um, clarify with you. A node is when they're over and then the antinodes are more close. Node? Antinode. seen some different definitions for these on the internet. So if you've been looking at different things, they might give different definitions for node and antinode. Okay, is that clear? Okay. Jacob? Number 27. Okay, so on this one, you are, the frequency is 1 over 2L is like square root of uh, T over mu, right? Square root of T over mu. And so here I'm increasing the tension by a factor of 2. So that increases by a factor of 2. And so in order to keep this equation balanced, I have to have root 2 over here. So my frequency is going to be times root 2. So to find out the new frequency, I say 320 times the square root of 2, which is... Uh, what, 450, I think? Yeah. So you can do different things, right? Like I could change L. If I change L by a factor of 2, the frequency would should be changed by a factor of a half. If I change mu by a factor of 2, the frequency would be changed by a factor of 1 over root 2. Whatever I do on the right-hand side, I also have to do the left-hand side. Brittany? Number 12, I keep getting 6.67. So I have 7, but it keeps saying Right, you do not round up. Because when you're doing the highest order maximum, um, D sine theta equals M lambda. If theta is bigger than 90 degrees, I get no orders. I don't get any spots because that light is going off behind the diffraction grating or behind the double slit or whatever it is you're dealing with. And so theta equals 90 degrees for uh, m equal, what you say, 6.7? Right, 6.67 or whatever? Yeah. And so that means that if it's bigger than 6.7, theta is bigger than 90 degrees. And you can't have that. And so that means that there is, there's really no order 6.7, right? It's either 6 or it's 7. And so you round it down. Even if this is like 6.99, you still round it down to 6. And that 7th order is not going to exist, only the 6th order. And I think there's a question on here too, wasn't there, about... We had to count the number of bright spots. Don't forget, it's one in the middle, and then in this case, six on either side. So six, six, and one is 13. 14? Oh, yeah, so that's like this one. That's this one. So a couple steps. So first you have to find what is the distance between the slits, and that's going to be one over 10,000 lines per centimeter. Be careful with your units on this. Uh, 1 over 10,000. It's in centimeters, so that's going to be 1 times 10 to the minus 6 meters. That is the distance between the slits. That's D. So that's the first part. And then I want to know what is M. So I say D sine theta equals m lambda, and I solve for m, where m is uh, d sine of 90 divided by lambda. Anytime I'm asking for the number of spots, we just let theta equal to 90. 
And so that's going to be D over lambda 1 times 10 to the minus 6 divided by 312 times 10 to the minus 9. Remember, nano is negative 9. So that's Three point two. That means that my highest order is three. I round it down. Not because it's point two, but because I always round it down. And so that means I have my central bright spot, and then I have three on either side. And my central bright spot with three on either side, right? So I have seven total bright spots. The only way for it to be 9 is if m is equal to 4. What, what are you thinking? Why 9? Because I didn't fully understand, um, I guess, I thought the bright spot would be 9. I always thought that it was because m was 3, that the 3 raised on the curve m part 1. That's what I Sorry, can you repeat that? Three. Can you repeat it? Can you repeat it? Just repeat it. I always it. thought that there was 3 wavelengths or 3 waves per m. So it would be 3 times 3 because hmm. on the previous problems it always ended up being that way that there was three per m but didn't it be more because of the one in the middle the big beat him the way that m said it, it was uh, if I could find the problem yeah. then I would have it okay. if you did um, one in the other one in the other I don't remember that. If you shoot me an email with it, I can address it over the weekend. Okay. But uh, yeah, I don't want to go on a good space right so now. But okay, so I first calculate the maximum order, just like the previous problem. I find the maximum order is three. That means that I'll have the central bright fringe, and then I'll have one, two, three orders on that side, and then one, two, three orders on that side. So three plus one plus three is seven. So seven total bright spots. Yeah, if y'all find that problem, shoot me an email. It's just one, so that it was three. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. It's three because I have one on either side. Um, so there was one where you found that m is equal to one. That means I get one order here, one order here, and then I also get the central bright fringe. And so those total number of bright spots is three. Three on each side, so it's seven. That's right. So it's going to be... So because there's three on each side, that's what it means. Right. Mm -hmm. I see your confusion. I'm sorry for that. Sorry about that. Can you also work out number next year? Sure. Guys, if y'all need to go, I understand. It's okay. I'll stay until we're done, but y'all can go if you like. Uh, number 19. Okay, yeah, so here I know that my intensity is going to be different by delta L over 10. 10 to the delta L over 10, so that's uh, 10 to the 0 0.3. And 10 to the 0.3 is 1.99 is equal to 2. So, so I had 2 watts per square meter. I make it louder. So now I have 2 times 2, which is 4. Remember, this is uh, I1 or I2 over I1. All right, guys, I'll post the rest of the stuff on. I'll rec I'm recording. I'll post it if you want. Okay, is that clear? <laughs> I'm sorry, Brittany, what did you say? So you take the two that you have and you multiply the two in the problem? Right, because, see, I'm looking at the factor between the two. Uh, and so I do that here. I find that my second I intensity is twice the first intensity. Like if I really wanted to be rigorous about this, I could say 
I2 over I1 is equal to 2. So I2 over 2 watts per square meter is equal to 2. As I put this in right here, and so I2 is equal to 4. Correct? Right. What else, y'all? Okay, higher frequency is this one. Uh, just when they're squished together like this. You know, you get more press per unit time. Yeah, so a uh, couple steps. First, you want to figure out what theta is. D sine theta equals m lambda. Uh, D is this distance, 0.1, 10 to the minus 3. Be careful with your units. Sine theta, m lambda, uh, that's going to be m is 2. Has a second bright fringe. Lambda is 650, so 2 times 650. So theta then is the inverse sine of 2, 650. divided by 0.1 times 10 to the minus 3. And I don't know, it is what it is. It's some, it's some very small angle. And then we say y is equal to L tan theta. L is uh, 5 meters tan of that angle theta. What is the answer here? 6.5. So what you get is you get 6.5 times 10 to the minus 2. So it's going to be 6.5 centimeters. So two steps. First, you need to find the angle theta, picking out that you're dealing with the second order. So m is equal to 2. Being careful with your units. You got to need to know all your prefixes, basically. Uh, milli is 10 to the minus 3. Nano is 10 to the minus 9. And then solve this for theta by doing the inverse sine of this business. Or right, take this over here and divide it. Do the inverse sine. I get theta. I think it's like 0.7 something. What is it? It's 0.74. And then I do 5 meters times the tangent of that angle. All right. Is that clear? Any other questions, Mr. Um, the, there's two factor problems where they're just plugging factor into into the problem. Okay. On this test? Okay, can I uh, clear this out? You sure? Alright. Let's see. This one, number 10? This one says, by what factor is the distance changed? Our... Okay, take a look. Any other questions from this test? Oh, this one, the length of a guitar string? Is that the one you mean, William? So we just we start with the expression, the equation here for frequency. If I'm increasing the length by a factor of two, that means I get a factor of two here. So I must get, because it's in the denominator, I get a factor of a half. So if the length increases by two, the frequency is going to change by a factor of a half, by 0.5.
Right, if the tension is doubled, it would be square root of 2. If it was mu that had doubled, the mass density, it would be 1 over square root of 2. And then what's the other one we looked at where the tension was doubled and, and the frequency was 320? Mm -hmm. um, That's this one down here. I can't remember what I put as my answer, but I did 320 times 2. That wouldn't be square right. Square rooted, and it wasn't an answer. Yeah, that's there, isn't it? 320 times root 2 is 450. No. It's 640. It's 25. So it wasn't. Oh, no, because you don't do that. You do 320 times the square root of 2. Not 320 times 2 square root, but 320 times the square root of 2. Alrighty. All right. <laughs> yeah, it happens. Uh, what else on this test, y'all? Good? We good to go? Is that all for the day? For number six. He's not ready. He's not going straight into the Right. B's not right at, uh, I mean, I know B is right. B is drawing correctly, so. Why is, oh, B is this one, I'm sorry. Yeah, so it comes down here. It should go through the focal point and then go, it's not right because, uh, that's just, it's just not right, but in order, in order for this to be parallel to the axis, it has to go through the focal point. See, like this one's right, but this one's not right. They both go parallel to the axis. No, to go straight through the lens. No, to go straight through the lens, I understand what you're saying, but to go, if it goes straight through the lens, it has to come to the middle. What do I fight that? Tyler. Uh, A is wrong. C is right. Oh, shoot. I'm sorry. Uh, what's the right answer? B. B is right. B is the incorrect ray. B is the only incorrect ray. Okay. I have my office. All right. Anything else? Oh, somebody else had a question. What was it? We're here. Sam, two. Three. Don't be sorry. Listen, they can go if they want. Nobody's keeping them here. Um, all right. So resistors. That's exam two. Okay. So the equivalent. Uh huh. So for resistors in series. They have the same current. Uh, the voltages are equal to the sum of the voltages. And the resistances, you just add them up. And then V equals IR. For resistors in parallel, they have the same voltage. The current. The total current is the sum of the individual currents. Uh, the equivalent resistance is that 1 over 1 over R business and V equals IR. So those are our rules for series and parallel. And so here, I want to know the equivalent. Well, first thing I do 
I do this, I say that's three. And then I have three, three, and three in parallel. It's so one over, you know, a third plus a third plus a third. That's equal to one. And so what I have is a three ohm resistor and a one ohm resistor. The 12 volt battery. And so that's the same as a four ohm resistor. That's going to have I equals V over R equals 3 amps of current. So that means I have 3 amps going through both of these resistors. 3 amps through a 3 ohm resistor is 9 volts and 3 volts. 3 times 3 is 9. 3 times 1 is 3. And good thing that adds up to 12. Now you might be able to look at it and just say, well, I know this volt. Well, kind of like we did before the capacitors. This is 3 times the resistance, so it has 3 times the voltage. And those numbers have to add up equal to 12. Listen, I use a lot of the same numbers because they work easily. 8 and 4, 9 and 3, 6 and 6, you know, stuff like that. So uh, look for those common numbers. And the answer is most, uh, I think all the circuits give you nice round numbers. So, I mean, all the options are nice round numbers. So the harder part is finding the voltage on a particular resistor. Now, which one were I asking for on the next question? Uh, R5. R5. I want to know the voltage here. Well, because I have three volts here, I have three volts here, three volts here, and three volts here. Because they're all in parallel. Resistors in parallel have the same voltage. Three, three, and three. Now, I could also ask, what is the voltage here? Right? I have uh, a one and a two ohm resistor with three volts across both of them. I have three volts. Uh, if I have three volts across a three ohm resistor, the equivalent is three ohms. That means I have one amp of current, V over R. So I have one volt, two volts. So R3 has one volt, R4 has two volts. By the way, this is three volts, this is nine volts. Pretty sure you have one like that. I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure you do. You know, slightly different circuit, but similar and difficult. I'm 98% certain. Okay. Um. Yeah. So what happens here is your current. I get some total current that comes through here. It splits up evenly between these two because they're the same resistance. So it's even split here. But over here, I get a small current and a big current because I have less resistance down here than I do up here. In fact, I'm going to get twice the current here and than what I get up here because I have half the resistance. So yeah, I get the biggest current in R5 because uh, that's the smallest resistance where it splits up. Now, R5 is the same resistance as it is over here, but because they were even over here, it split it up. Right. R5 has the biggest current. But you know, don't just memorize that circuit because I can give you a slightly different circuit or ask you different things about that circuit. Like, what's the current, what's the smallest current? What the, well, the smallest current would be R3 and R4. Or what are the different voltages, right? The voltages are directly related to the currents, by the way. So R5 would have the biggest voltage. R3 and R4 would have the smallest voltage. But you do need to know how currents distribute themselves in a circuit like that. That's so similar in difficulty, but potentially different. All right. Does that help a little bit, Carmen? It's important. You'll see resistors deserving. All right, people. Is that it for now? Our exam's not till one, so I'll be around Monday morning. So if you have issues, please come see me. Or even over the weekend, if you have issues, shoot me an email.